Uh, sir, shall we resume? Yes, ma'am. We can go. We can start. Okay. Thank you. So one of the major things that we look at when we are looking at protecting security is how do we classify it, protecting information, sorry. Not everything is as valuable. Not everything is as important. Not everything is as dangerous. Different kinds of information have different potentials for misuse and different potentials for harm. So. One of the things that an organization does, and this is something that we do as individuals as well, but we don't categorize it as clearly. And what is it? Whenever I am absolutely certain uh, that when you all were told that there was a cybersecurity class, at least the first time you all were told so, uh, the first thing that you thought of was, why cybersecurity? I don't have anything that anyone is interested in. And that is absolutely the first thought of almost everybody. I don't have anything that anyone is interested in. You might be right. You might be wrong. What you have might not be dangerous in a way that it will harm you. But it could be used to harm somebody else. So it's kind of like the whole logic that goes behind wearing a mask with uh, COVID-like infections. That wearing the mask is not so much to protect yourself, but is also to protect everybody else around you. So same logic kind of exists with cybersecurity. I'm not sure which logic came first, but anyway. So when you are categorizing, the most simple way of categorizing is the value of the data, the age of the data. What is its useful life? And is it in any way publicly associated to somebody? Is it something that can cause harm to a person? And if yes, then maybe that's something that does not need to be disclosed. These four boxes that are there are mutually exclusive methods of classification. They are not dependent on each other, though you might use more than one uh, parameter. The Northwest Quadrant is uh, the most basic qualifying factor, this one. Let me get the pointer up and running. Yeah, This one is the most basic. And of these, then, we might use different levels of classification. So what is the value of this data? Value of this data in what sense? Monetarily? Personally? Politically? Psychologically? What is the value of this data? Let's give you an example. You have a politically sensitive picture of a historical figure that is circulating, let's say, on social media. It's a picture that has been spoofed and is now being circulated. Some people will find it very amusing. Some people will find it, OK, why on earth would anyone waste time doing something like this? Some people would find it extremely hurtful and offensive. Of the group of some people who find it extremely hurtful and offensive, some of those people might resort to violence as a way of reacting to this. And so suddenly you've got a picture 
that maybe somebody made as a joke, maybe uh, somebody created for malicious purposes has now led to physical violence. What was the value of that picture in itself? The time and the effort and the cost that went into making that picture? Or was the value of that picture the damages that were caused to a city because that picture circulated? Both. Depends on who you ask. So, a lot of data, a lot of information is valuable not because you perceive it as valuable, but because of some intrinsic value within it that could cause great expenses or great losses at a different period of time. Some amount of data is also age sensitive. You did something as a kid, you broke your uh, mother's favorite serving plate. Is there a statute of limitation of punishment for that plate being broken? Depends on how valuable it was to your mother. So had you been caught at that point of time, you'd possibly have got yelled at, punished, and maybe in some way made to compensate for the loss. If you tell your mother that 20 years later, most likely your mother's going to laugh about it and say, okay, forget it. Or your mother is going to say that that plate was extremely valuable and it was a gift from somebody who was very precious to her. And so you know that the value was not the plate itself, but the value was the memories attached to the plate. And now, the punishment no longer matters whether it was in real time or 30 years down the line because the value of that plate has not diminished with age. Does the plate have a useful life? Yes. It was used for some amount of time after the while it got damaged or after the while it's lost color and you won't use it as a serving plate. But it is still kept there in storage. Did the plate have a personal association? Did it have a memory attached? Yes, it did. So how are you classifying your data? Do you have a picture that is put up on social media that was from some event you attended without your parents knowing? You sneaked out of the house, you went for the party, you said I was going to my friend's house to study. You went to a pub, you had a few drinks, you danced a little, somebody clicked pictures, put them up on social media. Your parents saw that picture. Next morning, when you go home, uh, you are in for the good yelling. When you are applying for the job and they do a background check, they come across this picture. And they say, this person is not a good culture fit for an organization, for our organization, because this is what the person has been doing. That's 10 years after the event. I, you went, you sneaked out and you went at the age of 18, 19, 20. At age 25, 27, 30, you are applying for the job. Their background search throws this picture up. And they say that you are not a culture fit. That's not even you any longer. It might be that you sneak out every day and go to the pub. Or you've not been to the pub since then or in the last five years. But that picture exists, and so the value attached to that picture still exists. So when data is being classified, you need to look at it from multiple different perspectives. Because maybe today that data does not need security, maybe it does five years down the line. Or maybe today that data is extremely critical, extremely valuable, because it is code of the software that you are currently building. Once you have built that software, once you have put it out on the market, 10 years down the line, you might choose to make that code public. It doesn't have any value because you've earned the money of the software that you would have. So those are things that you put into place. 
when classifying we also classify based on the business systems what are these systems that we are looking at is this system critical yes then give it additional security is the system vital to the security of the organization cctv footage what if the cctv camera stop working is that vital yes it is is the hr system which is handling payrolls critical or sensitive sensitive because if it's if all the employees know how much the other is being paid then the company has a bit of a problem you know payrolls are very very secret right nobody talks about them or nobody wants to talk about them companies don't tell you what another employee is earning those kinds of things uh, it's not like government payrolls where everyone has specific brackets corporate payrolls are very complicated and then you might have systems that are absolutely not critical like the system at the reception you might not have anything valuable there data classified based on sensitivity so here's the fun thing here we are classifying systems here we are classifying data so when classifying data based on sensitivity how sensitive is this i a nude picture of a person is always going to be sensitive a picture of a person playing with a dog or the cat is never going to be sensitive is the least classified and is going to be available on every social media i met a dog i met a cat i've got a picture with a very cute animal i'm going to put it up i have a picture with a very cute animal but i also have my partner with me in my picture who my parents don't know about now that's not unclassified but that is certainly sensitive so you will share it only with certain people on the group i have a secret partner which absolutely nobody knows about for whatever reasons and so i am going to click a picture but i'm not going to put it up anywhere it's confidential you'll share it only with that person i like a person i've got pictures of this person i'm stalking this person quite literally which is decidedly creepy but we'll use it as our example we've got this person we we really like this person we are going to click pictures of them without their knowledge and we are going to keep them secret nobody knows i have these pictures i am going to climb up the wall look at these look at this person in this person's bedroom and click pictures of this person when the person is in the bedroom those pictures suddenly become top secret even creepier than the first lot the same thing exists for companies we've got certain kinds of data that will be absolutely available on the company's websites anyone who wants to see it knows it's in newspapers it's everyone knows about it it is a uh, public knowledge you have some amount of data that is not classified but is certainly sensitive as in we've not received payments from three clients right now and we are going to have a slightly hard time paying our employees all our shares are dropping for reasons that uh, our ceo is being changed and so our shares are dropping it's not classified it's public knowledge but it is sensitive data how much are we paying the new ceo who's coming in how much are we offering him we haven't yet hired this person we are still offering this person that's classified nobody needs to know it did we give him other incentives to get him to come from another company into ours maybe non monetary incentives we've given him a house we've given him a car we've uh, arranged for the admissions in colleges for his children those are secret information don't need to be there top secret information would be the codes that are being shared with this person 
what credentials does he get? Does he get access to certain kinds of uh, computer systems that nobody else does? Those are top secret kinds of info. And based on availability, who do we share it with? Share it with everyone? Perfect. Slightly sensitive, we share it only with a few people? Or is it absolutely private data? So when classifying information, keep these things in mind. How are you going to classify your own information so that it helps you decide what levels of security you want to put onto it? To this, we add the policies. Within policies, we have laws, which could be universal, which could be national. Typically, we are concerned with the national laws. However, there are certain things like um, war crime laws, which are universal. They'll, accept, they'll exist across the world. National policies would be uh, things that we are most concerned with. So in our case, as far as cybersecurity goes, we are concerned with the IT Act, the Evidence Act, the uh, CRPC and the IPC. Uh, we are concerned with all the new amendments to the IT Act that are coming up. We are concerned with these kinds of things. Policies are not laws, as in failing to comply with the policy will not give you a jail term. Not complying with a law will give you a jail term or will have a pretty extensive level of punishment. With policies, depending on what is stipulated, it is most likely to be a financial burden that you would have to bear. So you'll have policies that are global, as in all companies that have that provide credit cards follow a certain level of policies. It is called the PCI DSS. And all credit card companies need to meet certain levels of security requirements. How are they checking? What kinds of uh, backgrounds do you have? Uh, are you getting a credit card, but you don't actually need one? Are you, is the security of the credit card fine? We've all got these credit cards these days that have um, wireless enabled. Do you have the ability to turn off the wireless as an individual? I don't want it. I find it very dangerous. I think anyone going by me could make it work. I don't like it. So I'm going to turn wireless off. Or I'm going to say, OK, let the wireless exist, uh, but let's keep it at 500 rupees and no more than that. Are these kinds of controls that exist? Has it been provided by the card provider? These are things that are part of global policy. Then you will have policies that are national. Like uh, given that we have the IT Act and the intermediary policies, all companies who act as intermediaries in India need to retain their data for a fixed period of time. What is this policy? How do we comply with it? Where are we going to store the retained data? How are we going to keep it safe? Those are policies that again come up. Industry specific could be absolutely to do with uh, your industry. So it could be something that is healthcare industry, which would be the HIPAA policy. Uh, it could be something that is, uh, again, uh, banking related. It could be a policy that is specific to manufacturing industries. So each of these have different kinds of uh, policies. There is one policy that has its, uh, it's a US policy that is implemented globally for all companies with US offices uh, and is a policy that is has Indian origins. So I don't think any of you all are old enough to remember this. But go ahead and Google the Enron scam, E-N-R-O-N. -N. Uh, Enron was this uh, electricity supplier in uh, Maharashtra. And there were huge frauds that were carried out by uh, the Enron board, all the way down to uh, 
claiming that they had more products than they did, they had more clients than they did, those kinds of things, uh, cheated the shareholders in the U.S., ended up being a really major fraud. And it led to, uh, once the fraud was detected, once the entire investigation and all happened, uh, it led to a policy being created, which is called SOX, S-O-X. <clears throat> and uh, SOX is the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, it's called SOX. And uh, it's a policy that is that says that the board of directors, particularly the CEO of a company, need to follow a certain set of uh, compliances. And that is not industry specific but is specific for any company with um, uh, a PIL. So a company which is public limited would have to follow SOX. And then you have your own internal policies. Um, I will change my... Uh, <clears throat> I'll change my display picture every three days. I need to change my status every day. I will... Uh, Everyone in the house needs to turn off their phones on a particular day. Like a friend of mine has this very intense policy. Um, they work in cybersecurity and has this very intense house policy, which is that absolutely no cell phone usage on Sundays. No digital devices will be used. So unless it is a very critical situation, all of us know none of us call them anymore on Sundays. Otherwise, uh, they are on call pretty much every day. So those are the internal policies that get put into place. <clears throat> One of the most far-reaching policies is uh, the GDPR. It's actually a law. And uh, it's a law that is that has, for the change, put the individual and the individual's privacy first. Most laws don't. So the GDPR is looking at protecting individual data and is has put measures into place about what happens and gives you, most interestingly, it gives you parameters that are laid out for what kind of data can be collected by a service provider. What kind of data can be collected by a social media platform? What kind of data can be specifically sold for advertising? Uh, what kind of uh, <clears throat> information can be used for different purposes? It also gives you, most importantly, the right, where is that here? The right to be forgotten and the right to erasure, which is the right to be forgotten is basically a right which says that I want my service provider to forget that I exist. So I had a Facebook page. And if any of you has ever tried deleting Facebook, you know it's a bit of a nuisance. So Facebook has a policy that says that um, if you want to delete your account, they'll suspend it for 90 days. And post 90 days, they will delete the account. So you've applied for the an account deletion. You have gone through 85 days and you say, it must be done. Let me just check. I think 90 days are over. You check and you realize that the account is still active. What happens is your account starts on the 85th day from one again. So now you have 90 more days to wait. What kind of data is shared with law enforcement if they ask for it? So I know there was a lot of uh, UN cry about a certain uh, secure mailing provider uh, who said that we don't store any data and we don't provide any data to law enforcement. However, the policy also clearly said that if given a warrant, they would provide specific kinds of data to the service providers, uh, to law enforcement. Of course, that is something nobody read. Everyone just looked at the basic page which said we will not provide data. So GDPR allows you to maintain these kinds of things. Can data be deleted? How are you going to delete it? Suppose you have an employee 
Or suppose you have an individual who wants their data deleted. How will you go about it? It also has the right to erasure, where absolutely everything about this person is removed completely. So effectively, this person does not exist anymore. This policy has been used as, a, as the basis for our data protection bill. Uh, our data protection bill has undergone considerable modifications after the Shri Krishna committee. And uh, some of the modifications have been good, some of them have not. Uh, many have again been debatable, so it's, I think, being discussed all over again. This is a jinxed bill. It's something that we have been trying for since almost 2000. And it just doesn't seem to happen for some reason or the other. So fully jinxed bill that uh, exists. One of the things that the Sri Krishna bill uh, committee was putting into place or suggested putting into place uh, was the right to be forgotten. And um, I think it has faced considerable um, objections. I'm, I'm not sure of it. So you've got that. We don't provide the right to erasure in India, uh, not even discussed within the bill. So that's uh, something that would have been nice if we had. But it gives 30 days for complying with a request, which is really, really good. So does uh, the GDPR. And in India, if this bill ever gets passed, I think it would be nice to have it. Compliance, remember, is not mandatory. You don't have to. You can choose to comply. Of course, you can get forced into complying, as in your clients need you to be ISO 27001 compliant or ISO 45000 something or the other compliant. So even if you didn't want to go ahead with doing this, now you have to because they wanted it. Or you can be aligned to a policy without actually complying with it. So complying means that you'll go through uh, frequent audits. You'll need to maintain the compliance throughout. You can align to it, which is that I think policies of uh, these policies of this particular compliance law are good. And we are going to put these into place. But we are not getting audited to make sure that we do it. These are the kinds of issues that come up with compliance. So remember, we also spoke about offensive security. What is that? What do we do? So offensive security is where we do a vulnerability assessment. We check. In theory, where all is this company vulnerable? OK. It seems like the employees are the most vulnerable. Somebody has taken their systems home. And now we are going to test it out. So once we've decided, in theory, where all these are vulnerable, we start off with doing certain exercises to test our theories. The primary of those is what is called penetration testing, where you try and break into the systems to see how much data you can actually extract, how far into the network you can get, can you make changes to the data? Will the employees know? Will the security teams of the company detect it? Those are the kinds of things that we are testing for. Phishing is uh, a particular favorite because employees react to email. All companies will have these instructions going out to employees saying, don't respond to phishing mails. Uh, trainings are carried out so that employees don't respond to phishing mails. But there are many, many phishing mails that can look absolutely authentic. You know, one of the major problems, I don't know, last week. Yeah, last week, there was this article in the Pune Mirror about an engineer of the PMC who fell victim to a phishing mail of the sort, uh, fell victim to what we call the CEO fraud, uh, where a person mailed him saying that he was the former CEO of uh, chairperson, CEO, something uh, of the PMC, commissioner, former commissioner of the PMC. And he needed him to do certain things and buy something so he could send it. Uh, this poor engineer did do that, uh, lost a lot of money in it. 
Then we do social engineering, which is try and see if we can convince employees to do certain things that we want them to do. Favorite among these is uh, turning up at the local chai stall or the local parking lot, uh, leaving a pen drive there, seeing if some employee takes it, plugs it into the office system, and gives us access to the entire network. Uh, pen drives in parking lots in chai tapris are very, very dangerous things. If you see them, throw them into the closest dustbin. These activities within a company are typically carried out by a red team. The red team could either be hired externally to do it, or the red team would be part of the organization itself. And their job is to constantly try and break the security of the organization. Not for malicious purposes, their job is to do it to see how good the security is and to try and uh, improve it in due course. So it's kind of like a military exercise. On the other side, we've got the defensive security where we again do a risk assessment. We are going to try and see. So here we've got a vulnerability assessment. Here we've got a risk assessment. What are we trying to break? What is most vulnerable? How quickly are uh, my devices going to be broken into? I'm constantly monitoring. Just in case a pen test is happening, just in case somebody is breed, uh, breaking into my systems, I need to know, and I need to know quickly. So things like your uh, IDS, IPS, your firewall will be very useful here because they'll constantly be giving you logs that can be used. I'm also, the blue team is also responsible for implementing the security that we have. So the red team comes up with weaknesses, tests them out. The blue team first tries to stop the red team from breaking in. Second, if the red team has broken in, how have they broken in? What were the weaknesses that were exploited? What uh, improvements can be done to patch the security? Those are the things that the blue team will do. Finally, remember a business does not work on security. I mean, there are security businesses like ours, but for a normal business, security is just one of the many functions. It isn't the priority. Security is built to meet the business needs. So one of the problems that we always have is something called usability versus security. And we keep saying that, you know, we keep coming up with these crazy things. Uh, change your password every 15 days. You cannot use the last 10 passwords. Your password has to be a combination of alphabet symbols, numbers, blah, 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 and crazy stuff of this kind. It's a major pain in the neck. Hey, nobody remembers their passwords. Nobody is, if you are in the middle of work and you are absolutely just waiting to log in and start work, critical client project, and you get this company pop up that says, Shweta, change your password. You've not changed it in two weeks. You're spending five minutes doing that, and you're not likely to remember your password at the end of it. So you're going to write it down. Where's the security when you're effectively putting in principles that are negating it? So it's a very often a nuisance. For most companies, usability does get preference over security. And it might be right. So what we need to do is make sure that security aligns with what the business needs. I, I might feel that I want fault knocks like security in my business, but my business doesn't need it. My employees are incapable of dealing with it. If I tell my employees you're going to get three-factor authentication, you're going to get one message on your cell phone, you have to have a biometric print, and you have to have a password, my employees are basically going to say, look, we can't work. It's taking up too much time. It's like when you go to the bank. Have any of you all been to the banks recently? And you've got this biometric that is required. Now, the bank has a fun thing. The bank outsources some of the jobs to vendors. Those vendors come into the bank, and they sit down, and they do the work there. They don't have biometric access. 
So now every time that person sitting at the desk needs biometric access, they need to call the correct person with the correct biometric. Now that person could be doing other work, could be chatting, could be out for a cup of tea or the smoke, could have gone to the loo and so that line just keeps getting longer. That's not exactly best security practices. So when looking at security, what we need to do is three things. One is figure out who is the final deciding authority on what security is required. Two, how is this person going to make the decisions? On what parameters? Is it going to be on uh, risk? Is it going to be on the value of data? Is it going to be because of fear factors? Is it going to be for any other reason? And the third is identify how much your budget is. You can't overspend on security because the security budget can be infinite. You hand over a blank check to somebody like uh, me and your security is going to go crazy. But every company has a different security posture that they will put into place. What works best for them? That's the same thing that applies to individuals. Think about those before you start implementing your security or while implementing your security more correctly. Okay, I am going to stop here. Questions? You can happily type your questions out into the chat box, or if you feel like, you can uh, raise your hands and then you can speak. No questions at all. Nobody understood a word I said, I assume. Okay, Sagar sir, over to you. Yes, good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are, ma'am. Yes. Um, so, you know, just to ask, like, if any students doesn't have question, just to make sure that. And of course, as always, the questions can come to me later as well. Ah, uh, yeah, sure, ma'am. We'll ask students if they have yeah. any. We'll just send the questions to you. That works. Yes. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, I'll yeah, just continue. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, to begin with, the vote of thanks. I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Ms. Sweta Chavla, ma'am, for the very informative and interactive session that we just had. So basically, ma'am, uh, as usual, she's been a very good guider, uh, guidance and the mentor to us. So it has been a pleasure attending your lectures and to be the dynamic, like the part of your dynamic teaching. So ma'am has always been accommodating to our requests over the years and we wish to continue collaboration in the future with you. So uh, also I would like to thank our principal for continued support with extra credit program and our extra credit coordinator, Dr. Khare ma'am, Dr. Deshpande ma'am and Dr. Musmade ma'am for um, helping us continue with this uh, session. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Sagar Thakurdas for ensuring a smooth session online and my dear faculty members who have helped us make this session successful. Also, the final thank you to all the enthusiastic students who have been attending with their sincere response. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. It's um, always my pleasure to work with you all. Yes, ma'am. Even we are thank happy you. for the same. Thank you. Yes. Great. Bye-bye. Yes, bye ma'am.
So the students in the meeting can leave the meeting now.